Good afternoon, all. It is a delight to see all of you here on a Monday night, the beginning of the week. Thank you for taking the time to come uh, to join in a, an, an evening of poetry. It's, it's, this, is, this is a real, real privilege. My name is Paul Brink, and um, on behalf of Gordon College and the Center for Faith and Inquiry, uh, welcome. I'm uh, the director of CFI, working closely with Ryan uh, Soltero, who is the program uh, coordinator. Uh, tonight's reading is part of a continuing series of CFI events uh, that is taking place over the uh, academic year, uh, touching on, in some way, the question of the one and the many. And uh, many of you perhaps were here not so long ago when Professor Ivy George delivered a talk. This is part of a sim the, the, same, the same series. Um, one of the many, broadly considered, but in the church and American society and at Gordon, we encounter many questions that relate both to our oneness and to our manyness. And uh, I'm grateful to Michal for continuing to think about this with, uh, with, with, with us today. Um, I'm going to invite Professor Mark Stevick up here to introduce our guests in just a, a few moments, but I did want to mention the next CFI event, uh, which will be held in this space in a little more than a, in a, than a month. Tuesday, March 19th, Soong Chan Ra, theologian from Fuller University, uh, will be speaking uh, also on the theme of the one and the many. So I look forward to seeing you there. Uh, Professor Mark Stevick is a, a longtime member of our English department. Many of you will know him from creative writing classes or English, other English classes. Uh, Mark, will you introduce our guest for us? Thank you for the applause. We first met the poet Michal O'Shiel here at Gordon in 1997 at the college's production of Dancing at Lunasa, thanks to philosophy professor and perpetual whistler, Grady Spires. Here's proof of that date, the actual program. Michal is especially thanked in the program. I should say we met the excellent poet Michal O'Shiel, though forsooth I didn't know any of his poems in 1997. I knew him first as a dialect coach pressed into service to help us pronounce the play properly. But when I cast my mind back toward that summer of 1997, <laughs> different kinds of memories of Michal offer themselves to me. That's the opening line of Dancing at Lunasa without the name Michal. Uh, although the, the main character is, is maybe Michal. Michael. Oh, it's, no, it's not. It's not, it's not. <laughs> it Maybe Michael, but not Michael. Michael, there we go. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes. Brian yes. Friel, the excellent playwright of that show, was a great friend of Michal's, two admirers of each other's art, and both lovers of the 2B pencil, as it happens. Some of you may not know their work yet, but you already share their loyalty to the soft lead and clay of the 2B. They were friends, Michal and Brian Friel. I could say, of course they were friends, of course, but that's a, a little pushy, a little assuming, a little intrusive, a bit too easy, which Michal's poems exactly aren't. They're not easy, as in facile, not easy, as Richard Wilbur uses the word in a poem to his young daughter, who, oh, while typing, point. pauses as if to reject my thought and its easy figure. And Michal's poems are not easily, easy formally, with their fixed meters and their flexible rhythms and frequent rhymes. Though the poet's skill with these elements harmonizing them, and the language falls easily, pleasurably, on the ear, here indeed is ars est celare artem. Michal's art is to hide the art, not all that easy to do. In fact, as you will find tonight, hearing his Poems, poems, yes, but I can't think of what to compare them to, what else to call them. Today, what comes to mind, his fine watches. I've been lately enjoying videos of these beautiful, intricate, reliable, and useful engineering marvels, Rolexes, Patek Philippe's, others, being restored, admiring their workings, their complex, interrelying parts, the jewels all coordinating in a pleasing, portable shape that delivers the beauty of the exact time with an easy turn of the wrist. That's as close as I can come. Hearing these marvels of his read aloud as we first did in 20, 
14 with his collected poems, or again in 2017 with one crimson thread, the phonemes, the feet, the spondees, the chimings, combining into images and hemistics and quatrains and stanzas, you will marvel at how the turns of line and phrase deliver the beauty of exactness to your ear and, yes, allow it, your heart. When Michal reads, Wilbur again, a stillness greatens, in which the whole house seems to be thinking. Twice before, in Jenks 237, from front row center to the second non-existent mezzanine, the stillness greatened and greatened and greatened, and the whole house seemed to be thinking. Remarkable and rare is that experience, and the poet who just shapes it. How do you say that old English word, Graham? Shop. You probably, you know. Uh, I don't need to tell you that he's published 17 books of poetry, won many prestigious prizes for them. You'll know that soon enough after I welcome to your house this afternoon the excellent Michal Oshir. Thank you, thank you for the kind words. Thank you. Now, who has taken my reading? No one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I have nightmares about that. <laughs> so, good evening to you all, and thank you for being here. It's a great pleasure to revisit Gordon uh, College. I want to thank, um, obviously, Ivy George, who negotiated with the college uh, for the reading. I want to also to thank Mark Stevick for your lovely words of introduction, and also to thank Carolyn Harkaway Krieger for your being involved in it as well. And on the administrative, administrative side, I'd like to thank also Paul Brink and Ryan Soltero for your con contribution to getting the evening together. In early spring of 2020, as the COVID-19 pandemic was spreading across the world, it was a time of extraordinary fear. A time like no other probably since the influenza of 1918. Isn't it extraordinary that in this era of sophisticated technology and medicine, that a virus, a parasitic pathogen, brought the whole world of ours to its knees? It seems almost unreal now that we lived through such a time. And I think our natural reaction is to say, we want to forget it. We want to leave it behind us. We want simply just to get on with life. And apart from maybe new hybrid models of work or perhaps even more casual work attire, let it be business as usual. But do we owe it? to the over one million in this country who died, the six million who died worldwide, to think more deeply about what causes pandemics and to ask ourselves, what can we learn? Globe-trotting pest, jet-setting parasite, nabbing victims everywhere the same, riding on a breath nowhere airtight, do we planet spoilers bear the blame? No, enough. Why seek a blame or cause or rehearse what our frail world went through? Best living in what is than in what was. Let the past just pass and start anew. All such memories should we best discard. Ships when plowing on forget their wake are for the dead and for tomorrow's sake. Seek to mend a globe our greed has marred. Through remembrance, we salute the dead. Tragedies look back to look ahead. Perhaps we have too long believed ourselves masters of the universe and have lost any sense of being part of the weave of nature of having the humility to be in tune with the world around us. We often don't see ourselves as having a responsibility as caretakers 
but rather we possess the planet. It's ours to dominate. No, we do not own our mother sphere. We whose role is Stuart and Lisi, in our greed we are so cavalier, sundering our own nature's filigree. Climates shift and beings all migrate, shunning warmer parts from which they fled, changing how we creatures all relate, passing unknown viruses that spread. Still so much that no one understands, will there be more waves, will it mutate? Staying far apart and washing hands, we relearn forbearance and we wait. Nature shimmies far beyond our ken, teaching us humility again. One coronavirus, who'd have thought, needing to discover the unknown, we become the lordly cosmonaut, claiming all this cosmos as our own. Flybys, probes that orbit and then land, gearing up to walk on planet Mars, yet to come a spaceship landing manned, space faring humans reaching for the stars. We, the once earthbound who walked the moon, underrated viruses' impact. In our achievements, did we seem immune? In our pride, were we too slow to act? By one virus brought back down to scale. In our glory, earthlings still so frail. I mentioned the one million dead in this country and well over six million worldwide. But what are numbers? Every death is singular. It's too easy to forget that every face is someone's beloved. And recall how the dying for fear of infection could not be surrounded by those who love them. Newscasters counted thousands worldwide dead. What do thousands mean? Each death is one. In each digit, see one face instead. Someone's father, mother, daughter, son. Sleepless cities, newfound silent nights, in strange muteness tossed in their distress. Woke to sirens, red-blue flashing lights, hastening through a somber noiselessness. Fingered ones, before they know, confined in seclusion, pests could not outsmart. All beloved faces left behind in last agonies were set apart. Cared for by a kind but masked unknown, tended to the end, they died alone. I think it's in many ways so easy to lose consciousness of the terrible ethical problems which doctors faced during the pandemic. The hospitals were simply not equipped for the hundreds of patients in danger of dying. My wife, Christina, who is a surgeon in New York, was finishing an operation when a ventilator was snatched away urgently to the emergency room. Who would get the ventilator? Then the decision. Who had the best chance of survival? Who would have to be let die? Beds and gurneys crowded on each floor. New field hospitals, posts, head a sign. Medicine embraced war's metaphor. Doctors redeployed to the front line. Each new shift, alas, shifts patient dead. Others in grave danger had arrived. Homing time, too tired or too in dread to revisit, see, who had survived. Breathless, suffocating multiply, ventilator scarce, how then to choose who to help 
and who they should let die. Life you'd likely save or likely lose. How to be while hardened to the task, one last caring face behind the mask. Someone, I think, once described health as not thinking about health. We only think about health when we're ill, and as soon as we're better, I think we instinctively forget the suffering and the pain. I wrote these po poems during the pandemic, and so in a way, some of them chronicle moments and details from a difficult and a frightening time that we otherwise probably wouldn't recall. Do you remember how it was when we had to learn to wash our hands again? A theologian friend of mine said, I'm blue in the face. He said, I can't stand it anymore. I'm absolutely fed up singing happy birthday twice. <laughs> so he timed the Lord's Prayer and said, that worked just as well. <laughs> Washing hands again and over again. Our new ritual throughout the day, soaping off each traitor pathogen. Some would sing while others chose to pray. Long enough for happy birthday twice. Bored with happy birthday, someone said, certain that his timing was precise, better to our fathers prayed instead. Finger twining foam and froth and rub, knuckles, joints and wrists with so much care, sudsy palms or bubbling nail top scrub. How to love this sensuous affair. Second time around, thy kingdom come, patiently to swirl each lathered thumb. But clearly, Beyond such particular features of an era, the much more significant question for us is, is, when it's over, in the light of such a cataclysm, how do we have survived, reassess our lives? How can we change the way of the world? COVID, we had named this enemy. That's aware how globally we mesh. Nose, we sweat in each Gethsemane. Fear, we'll go the way of all good flesh. Why this need for such a common foe, virus showing its respect for none? So easy to forget what we now know, how our frail humanity is one. In death's shadow, all intensified. As this ends, how will we reconcile life before and after and decide in our fragility now what is worthwhile? In the light of thousands now bereft, what desire will shape a world that's left? Maybe in the light of the pandemic, we need to understand what is our purpose? What are our goals? What really matters? How we wonder might all this have been if there was no web or cyberspace, just suppose we had not been by screen virtually conversing face to face. Busy, all those friends with time we lose who for years we'd always meant to call. Time to spare, once more we would swap news. Have we learnt what matters most of all? How we're loved, what love in turn we give. On a monitor, old warmth refound, found anew so much we could relive, covering our forgotten common ground. More together in enforced withdrawal, nettedness, that bound us one and all. Nature fired a shot across our bow, but so form former lives could rebegin. Thanks to fevered scientists' know how, we have reigned one deadly virus in. We say we care, 
But yielding to our greed, never nail our colors to the mast, not allow it fade into our past. Mother Earth, we think we can outsmart. All the while we slide to echo side. Only change desire can change our heart, cries the memory of all who died. Letting how it is be how it was, Covert we'll have curbed, but not its cause. The more I thought about epidemics, the more it bore in on me that they're inextricably and complexly interlinked with two other major crises which had preoccupied me very much. That is the destruction of the planet and the rampant capitalism of the digital age. According to the journal Science, and now I'm quoting, there is overwhelming evidence that climate change is fueling disease outbreaks and epidemics, and that it is not a matter of if, but when such events will precipitate another pandemic. Given this, I felt that any meditation on the main dilemmas of our time had to face the dangers to our habitat. Can we remind ourselves that this earth is a beautiful and integrated garden we need to tend? Might we once again find the modesty to understand our role in creation, which is still a work in progress? Garden given us to dress and keep, in our greed we mar. Who on earth do we still think we are? Dare we name ourselves as stewards now? Dominance of all our idle boast, flights from ravished habitats allow viruses to find their human host. As we sow, we weep. Grieving God once bid for seven days, Noah built his ark. Two by two, our creatures would embark. All things that swim or creep or crawl or fly, saving from the flood at most a pair. In love's covenant, they multiply. Every being just in being there gives creation praise. In our stewardship, we can't forget heaven has begun. Nature stewarded, and we are one. God who stayed the hand of Abraham shows creation loves self-sacrifice. Lions may yet lie down beside a lamb. Work in hand, unfolding paradise, now and still not yet. I'm afraid that in our craving for comfort and for convenience, we're all guilty. We intend so often to mend our ways, and then we forget. We're aware our damage gathers pace, moves now near our own. How Katrina's tropical cyclone maimed New Orleans or how heat waves scorch beyond what we had known before, and even so were still convenient slaves who consume and somehow half ignore signs of what we face. Now by such and such a year, they say, four Celsius degrees, warmer world and ice sheets will unfreeze, swathes of earth will flood and overheat. Though our heads don't doubt all this is true, cataclysms too remote to meet, prophecies of dark we know were due, seem still far away. Hard to heed what is less now than then, while we don't deny how disasters threaten us and why, busy in each day's own grief and some joys, holding on for all we're worth to hope. In the sweetness of our life's sweet noise, we remember how we need to cope and then forget again. 
almost like a debt of smog and grime we're now paying for. So we think this built up long before our own time when industry began. Yet half of all that we have ruined happened in one three decades brief span. Mother Earth is sustaining half her wound during one lifetime. What a restless species we now are, hurtling here and there, jetting fuel vapor through the air, gadding on our motorways nonstop. Spoilt first world, uneasy in our core. We still drive and fly and country hop, smirching as we never had before. Roam this earth we mar. Deadly virus stowaways conspire, find their hosts worldwide, on our unrest spongers hitch a ride. Could we not explore where we, hear where we are, wonder and the ordinary merge, ask ourselves why we should journey far, or what drives this quite consuming urge? What do we desire? Climate change and this whole environmental crisis, I think, asks very fundamental questions about who we are. Interestingly, the origin of the word crisis is, the, is a Greek word for decision. It comes from the Greek verb krinine, to decide. It's a decisive point, a turning point where we have to make major choices. Firstly, do we opt for generosity, or are we determined to defend any privileged position? And secondly, do we see crisis as simply an impending disaster, or can we view a crisis as a unique opportunity for change? Maybe global warming is forcing us to choose, to ask ourselves who we really are. Climate now, the wind cone of this age, wants us all to choose, side with one of two unlike world views. We are questioned how we opt to live, forced in turn to home at counterpoles, open-handed or acquisitive. Climate our barometer of souls, spirit pressure gauge. Any curbs, and some feel they're controlled, climate an excuse, yet another jealous scheme that skews how the markets can forecast each need, each ruse to pamper those who fail. Commerce always drives, uh, commerce always driven by our greed, bigger means, economies of scale, what all have they hold. Others see a crisis as rebirth. Yes, we must survive, yet beyond duress, how best to thrive. Will the richer half come to agree? Who first foul the nest first cleans? Dare we think of global equity? Weathering the threat becomes a means to redream our earth. Similarly, the exploitations of the high-tech companies are intertwined with the pandemic and with the environmental crisis. Yet, we fail to curb our greed, our need for comfort, for convenience, and instant communication on the internet, which began as an idealistic dream of making knowledge universal, has resulted in overconsumption that further harms this planet. Our consumerism is driven by algorithms and internet surveillance. An extraordinary book called Surveillance Capitalism, The Fight for a Human Future at the New Frontier of Power by Shoshana Zuboff inspired this section of desire. Uh, it's an extraordinary book. Her book reads like a Greek tragedy because you have these two young, flawed idealists and how they succumb to greed 
And at the same time, her book is a, a plea to curb the Internet's all pervasive ability to spy, control, and to exploit us. Any of you who have been recently watching the Congress committee will <coughs> know what, that, what it can lead to in all sorts of sexual exploitation. It's quite horrible. Upright founders scorned advertising, service to their users their ideal. Then the sudden dot-com world downswing. Surely I'm a schmuck, or what's the deal? Asks one genius. So were they to be one more startup crushed by fortune's wheel? Venture capital had set them free to refine the Earth's best search machine, earning fees from every licensee. Now the bubble burst, though they had been sure they could, they could succeed while ethical. Their financiers begin to lean on these wonder boys of principle. There's a bottom line and balance sheet. How much earned here on their capital? Backers now are turning up the heat. Such impatient money needs gains soon. Venturers will threaten their retreat. Must this dim their vision's honeymoon? Devil supping with too short a spoon. Who had searched and when and where and what stored half wittingly to help all find just exactly what they sought and not to derive income. But now behind users' backs, much knowledge once dismissed will become a rich resource that's mined. All they tell their users to assist sending relevant advertisements, records of behavior that exist. What had been just surplus now presents ways to sidestep searching by keen word. So instead, they now, to all intents, misappropriate what is transferred from the service of the user to target customers. As undeterred, they keep thieving knowledge they accrue. Their whole business starts to readjust, sell their searchers private residue. However justified, a breach of trust. Once high-mindedness, now money lust. More that's earned, the more a lust dictates. Newer snoop techniques to guarantee advertisers higher click-through rates. Data bought lets marketeers foresee who is likeliest to want to buy targeted campaigns, their golden key? Most of us, unmindful how they spy, on the face of things must bless the net. Think of all the ways that we rely on the speed of links or how we're let talk across the world to friends on screens. See the children, children now beget. Our in-pandemic days, our quarantines, Zooms of company for which we yearned, half aware of how behind the scenes, dreams about face since the business turned rootless when the dot-com bubble burst, rides still roughshod to those trillions earned. Double-faced, this net is blessed and cursed. The corruption of the best is worst. Is privacy now a thing of the past? Is there anywhere to hide from the all-seeing eyes of the net keepers who pry and probe? Alexa is listening. <laughs> Can we no longer have a secluded place, a retreat, a concealed abode. So deep the need for us to home, to roost, somewhere where our secrets are our own, yet so easily we have been seduced. 
Although exteriors at first were known, backpack cameras nabbed all inside, nothing private, nothing left alone. Surveillance leaves us nowhere we can hide. In our overburdened lifestyles, we've fallen prey to voices that provide answers to requests that can relieve us of tasks, our soothing maids of ease who follow our commands, although they thieve. Locks are light, our thermostats, but she's sniffing words like love, dislike, are bought. Spying all the while, she seems to please. As smart listeners learn to read each thought, captives of our ages ease syndrome. In our craving comfort, we are caught. Where is our shell? What sanctum won't they comb? What or where can we now call our home? I think we have to have the courage, and it was fascinating to see that committee being bipartisan, bipartisan in, in these days in America, uh, um, have to have the courage to enact laws to curb surveillance capitalism. I have to hope, though, that this impulse to defend humanity can be part of a sea change in our culture, in a way of seeing and living in the world. But sadly, all too often we are duped by our own love of ease and speed. Click or tap, all knowledge now accessed. Gone the tracking down, the search ordeal. Lost all serendipities of quest. Though we longed for things, yet once we'd feel half of our delight was in the wait. Surely, sure that some mirage would yet be real. We require delay, so we gestate Longings deep enough for time to fill, yearning for what we could anticipate. Even in our thirst for life, we'd still fallen under our desire's own spell, joy deferred, a slower pending thrill. We no longer trust all will be well. Time is money now and waits for none. Time is not the time that used to tell. No delights postponed or no long run. What we want now, everybody deems better all at once than one by one. Slacked by our computer's instant streams, each desire quenched at the speed of dreams. Those uh, who capitalize on our, uh, uh, on our flaws like to make us, and particularly we who belong to an older generation feel ashamed that we are outmoded and we should get with it. Dizzied by the net's velocity, here's the world we're told to take or leave, how things are and how they have to be. Any doubts about how they deceive, serving us a name as they self-serve, any questioning the way they thieve or talk of how they maybe should observe rights of privacy and we soon find they respond by touching our raw nerve. Insecure, afraid of being behind, we are told how we should understand that technology too has a mind all of its own which evolution planned. Just as we had busted and had boomed, guided by the market's unseen hand. We must now be glad that we are doomed to acquiesce in crawls that data scrape, our compliance with it all assumed. What if we should press control escape? Cyberspace is surely ours to shape. The destruction of the environment with all its dire consequences and this invidious surveillance conducted by the high-tech companies are both largely driven by our greed. It seems to me that such avarice, this bottomless craving for wealth and power, is a strange perversion of, 
are of a healthy human desire. In the light of what people have suffered during the pandemic, surely we need to reassess our values. What is worthy of our desire? The ultimate question in our frail and passing human lives must be, what do we desire? Naturally, there's a hierarchy of desires, but what is our overall desire? Like it or not, our world is our habitat and something we all share. Now, artists sometimes doubt their efficacy in bringing about this understanding, and yet showing the richness of the world I think has a valuable role to play. Do we now need an ethical approach to technology as there is so much we could but should not do? Do we have to curb our greed, our excessive ambition, and let fame and fortune be to love? Should we rediscover our more modest role in the greater scheme of things? What is all this craving for success, endless need to score a better score, some fresh signs of status to possess, some new golden calf we can adore? Wanting always more and more and more, up and up we climb the greasy pole, trying to gain a world we lose our soul. Something insecure in us still drives such pursuit of power and fame and wealth, using up the sum of our quick lives. Maybe thinking riches might buy health. Come night's thief that catches all by stealth. Some see wielding power as self-defense, so surround themselves with opulence. Is there one outstanding moment when we find peace in simply knowing how there's no need to find desires again? All our being wants to avow one desire so full that there is now nothing needed over and above, letting fame and fortune be to love. Love, of course, may be at the core of our lives, but nevertheless, in the daily round, we have to act, take decisions, make choices. I've always thought that point was best made by an old story, which I'm sure many of you know, about the man who wanted to win the lottery. Oh, he wanted so, so badly to win the lottery. He prayed and he prayed and he prayed for weeks and then, begging God, pleading God on his knees to win the lottery. Please, please, God, let me win. And eventually, God appeared to him and said, will you do me a favor? Will you buy a ticket? <laughs> that same thought that we have to act uh, is, it was expressed in a different way for me when I was a schoolboy and playing on schoolboy rugby teams, because we had a priest coach who used to say to us when we had an important match coming up, beforehand he'd say, you've got to pray as if you couldn't play. But then he'd send us out in the field and say, you've got to play as if you couldn't pray. <laughs> so even though we're loved, and two are called to embrace what best we know to do. So desire by which we are enthralled shows us all its richness and breaks through to display a heaven tried and true where persistence keeps revealing how we create our heaven here and now. Desire for us is neither whim nor mood. Beckoned we all know we must obey. Work becomes an act of gratitude, faithfulness from day to day to day, somehow almost merging toil and play. Ours, a calling nothing else can mute, one long-term desire, a life's pursuit. None of us believes we work alone. When we best achieve, we self-transcend. What would we succeed in on our own? We fulfill each other to one end, our overlappings that both clash and blend, callings interwoven in one choir, 
round a countess firmus of desire. In our culture, we've been so formed by this drive for progress. And undoubtedly, there's been huge improvements and advances. We just need to think even of medicine. But perhaps there are some limits to our powers in times when we need to replace greed with generosity and maybe regain a meeker posture so that not to exacerbate our errors. We've made mistakes that only a newfound humility might absolve. Progress still our one and only dream. Though we know all cultures rise and fall, somehow we believe we'll reign supreme, driven by a market's free for all. We can't see how nature starts to stall. Empires die of their, excess, of their excessive needs. Are we biting now the hand that feeds? Is a slow and peaceful change enough? Many who despair of politics claim that we will need regimes who are tough. Our demand, we find a techno fix, problems engineered by our skilled tricks. Cures utopian and those too small may be best combine the work of all. More than anything, a humbler heart, paradigms must shift our old mindset, shape the jazz of life lived a la carte, canes in us wine our jubilees wipe debt, misdeeds we have permission to forget, give and take God's lavish earth requires, home again in generous desires. Although, of course, by, by times, as Tennyson expressed it, nature's red in tooth and claw, we're part and parcel of it, and we can never hold complete sway over it. We have to respect our environment beyond our apprehension and even see its grandeur. Nature is our home and habitat, yet so long a backdrop and resource that at will each clever technocrat simply as a matter of due course could dominate or master it by force. By our needs, all beings are defined, channeled to the wants of humankind. Trying to control by power and wealth, dominance must be a kind of fear, scared of futures catching us by stealth, we can't see the glory that is near. Since we do not trust, we have to steer. Never enough as even in excess, still we dread our own precariousness. God of our surprises, tell us how not to master our control. Instead, let all interwoven being wow us with hybrid beauty you've crossbred. Let us look around, not look ahead. Now is where our past and future chime, deep in your polyphony of time. I know there is a generation now that worries about the future. How will the world be for their children, for their grandchildren, for their great-grandchildren? How will they judge us? What kind of ancestors will we have been? Surely our purpose must be to hand down a planet where those who come after us can thrive. We do not want to be seen as predecessors who in our avarice destroyed the delicate ecological balance of our planet, precursors who saw the imminent danger and turned a blind eye. Handing on this life is our success. Countless generations down the line, we can be the forebears they will bless for our seeing nature's own design, where in habitats all lives combine, bound in the abundance of it all, one creation for the longer whole. Always in advancement's hungry name, each year we've taken twice the earth can bear, 
all the biosphere for us fair game, fouling our own nest and half aware, we espouse an easy laissez-faire. Endless quests for progress can't stand still, empty more than nature can refill. Enough, enough to be just thankful for this our world so whole and so entire in its balanced state of self-rapport. God of love, God in the bushes fire, hides a face in all we most desire. Life and light creation's golden bow. Our own holy land is here and now. I've always been fascinated by the passage in Exodus where God speaks to Moses saying, while my glory is passing by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and protectively cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Clearly, Moses mustn't see God's face because you can't see God's face without dying. Still, I feel sure we so often are so self-concerned that we miss the traces of this passing by. Maybe we've been near and did not know how we had not seen a sacred spoor. Self-absorbed, we miss the afterglow, faintest glance, a glimmer now obscure, vestige of a shine which means for sure that a silent glory passed unseen, leaving intimations of its sheen. How to be alert, to snatch a glance, catch a solitary stolen peak, glimpse the back if not the countenance. Even if absconding or oblique, yet it must be everything we seek, though we only barely comprehend our desire's beginning and its end. Maybe touching someone's loving hand, laughter shared with friends on sunlit days, lavish gifts our hearts half understand, or perhaps some bidden words of praise in a passing stranger's sideways gaze. Footprints of a presence, trail or trace, God of hints and signs, a hidden face. I've got to admit, I sometimes feel overcome with a deep-seated urge to give thanks. There have been so many wonderful things in life. Even though living fully in the here and now, and all the, even, even doing that, all the riches of the past can't simply be discarded. Time left behind is if it never happened. The only way I know to allow the past shine through the present is to be grateful. As for the future, surely it's bound up with what we desire and what we hope. But even in our short-term desires, we are sometimes wrong-footed by a god of surprises. Perhaps the most fruitful desire is to know what we should desire. Delighting in creation as its guest, our desire no longer is control. Prayer is mostly gratitude expressed. Even thanking with both heart and soul, what can we still add to what is whole? Though a claim may seem superfluous, Praising such a fullness fulfills us. Thankfulness still keeps the past in mind, layers what is with all that was before. We both look ahead and look behind. So we sometimes find we must implore in the light of what we have asked more. Though not in control, we still must hope, even beg for things we need to cope. We cry out and trust no cries in vain as we slowly come to realize, though we seek so often we attain, not what's sought but taken by surprise, get all we ask for in another guise. With our God, in turn we too conspire, pray to know what best we should desire. Lewis Carl once famously said, begin at the beginning and go on till you come to the end and then stop. 
As this reading draws to a close, I'm going to end at the end. <laughs> I'll finish by reading the epilogue to Desire. I don't know if any of you have studied Latin at school, it's gone somewhat out of fashion, but if any of you learned Latin at school, you were introduced to Caesar's work on the Gallic Wars. You'll remember the well-known start, Gaul as a whole, divided into three parts. Well, Desire is divided into four parts. The first part of Desire is entitled Pest and Chronicles, as you've seen the experience of the COVID pandemic in New York. The second, called Habitat, links the pandemic to the greed and consumption at the root of the environmental crisis. The third, behind the screen, deals with how the consumerism is driven by the internet surveillance and exploitation. And finally, the fourth and final part, Desiring, suggests we reorient our values by asking what should be our overarching desire. I think it is an attempt to regain the sacred. The epilogue is a recapitulation of these themes. Where to now? We know we can't return to old greeds that play with nature's fire. Never such an urgent need to learn how to shape our world with new desire. Science, arts, or purse and politics, history and hope quintets express. Yet this mesh of faults we need to fix, vision is best tested under stress. Though new desire may drive new human care, yet we work to find the way and will, moves to hasten overdue repair. We must be creation's mender still. No long fingered decades now to waste in our world so one and interlaced. So easily we might self second guess, in such urgency begin to doubt how our craft can tend a globe's distress, wonder if all art is opting out. Just to praise creation's strands one weave, to reshape desire is still to act. Seers of the whole are tasked to leave earth as is in heaven's prayer intact. We to serve, whose calling is to plumb glories of a world seen in the round, trailers and foretastes of kingdom come, show in shape and hue in word and sound. Seeing how all things connect, we trace the eternal in each now our lives embrace. Every choice we make plays dominoes. Globe wide, no economies discreet. Cyber world both drives our greed and shows others how, as profligates, we cheat. Soon eight million Earth can still sustain if we curb conveniences we crave. And as brothers keepers, unlike Cain, avoid excess, rethink how we behave. New practices and things we must forego, as some in luxury will strive to find bigger hearts, so we do not now sow vengeance of seeds in those we leave behind. Love's creation tends our human needs when one world reigns in its wants and greeds. Far so long, geography mandates, Lebensraum defense, power's bag of tricks, Will we grow beyond our nation states, us and them of geopolitics? Cities home to thirds of humankind in these hubs of opulence or dearth, all our loyalties so intertwined, ask if we can still repair the earth. Pollution and all pests ignore frontiers. We've no boundaries to guard or fix. Humanity now thrives or disappears, healing planet wounds our politics. 
no captives of a chance geography, world of neither us nor them, but we. Once we know there's no unknowingness, much we could, but no, we must not do. Blessings, yet temptations to transgress. Apple bitten, we may come to rue. All the marvel science can, sciences can seize, magic bullets, nature's wonders cash, vaccinations warding off disease. Yet one, one fission turns our globe to ash. Techno dreams of internetedness, surprise of talking face to face on screen, worlds of knowledge free for all excess, gifts the snooping maestros still demean. Always what we should not, what we should, what we know now, we must know for good. In a reckless world which greeds destroy, how we shape desire now make or break. Will we trust fulfillment in God's joy, all creation loved for love's own sake? Joy that is before and after time is already here and now if we in our desire can shift greed's paradigm. So the love with which you have loved me may now be in them and I in them. Millennia in turn will pass and still from this farewell prayer all future stem, every choice we make for good or ill. Trust in how both heaven and earth conspire, glories in one ultimate desire. Thank you for coming and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, a bit of just a bit of time for a, a Q and A. Is uh, Jenna? Yen, uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe a, a microphone. Be up for a few questions. Yeah, we'll we'll have, have a few there. We can. Who has? Who's going to break the sound barrier? For, are we? And, and, and if this doesn't take off, we have to. I was asked if I'd, uh, if I'd do a Q&A, and I said sometimes Q&A means bathos. You build up a, a poetry reading, and then it can flop with no questions. Uh, but I said it being an educational institution, I was willing to do it. So, uh, so uh, that's not. Uh, I was wondering what made you choose that form for your poem, like you have a strict form um, with rhyme and things. So I was wondering, like, do you always write with rhyme? Do you always write in a form or do you usually do free verse? And like, how did that work to write a whole like long work of poetry in that form? Well, I, 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 I have written poetry which hasn't strict form, but I tend to write uh, in, 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 in forms. Sometimes um, traditional forms, sometimes forms I invent. Uh, um, but I just, you know, it, it, for me, it goes back to childhood. It goes back to, to lullabies. It goes, you know, we love, we love sounds. We love rhymes, uh, you know, uh, and even children's rhymes. There's, there's magic. There's something about sounds that, that, that both mean and play music at the same time. It's quite, so why eschew that is my feeling. You know. I, I was going to say, did that answer your question? But I once did that in a shop in, uh, in Chicago and they said, no. <laughs> yes. 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 Thank you. So do we. Like your son, you were writing sonnets. The first, the first section, the section about, um, about the pandemic is in sonnets, but that's and the one about the about the uh, digital world 
is in Tratsarima. Try that. <laughs> <laughs> mentioned that you wrote the first part about COVID during the pandemic. Um, I'm wondering how that was if with, at that time everything was unknown, how long it would last and what the outcome would be, if that was helpful writing about it or if you found yourself, um, or just how that affected you. Look, the, the, the only answer I can give to that is that the only way I can cope with, uh, with, with deep emotions is to write. Uh, to, to describe it, to, to be part of it. Uh, and so I was scared. I was very scared in New York. My, as I said, I would drive my wife to Mount Sinai every morning where she's a surgeon. And outside, there were three or four lorries f with, with, with corpses frozen in them. And across Central Park was white as if snow had come down. It was tense because for the overflow of the hospital. So, you know, it was a very, very scary time. And I'm at an age where it might have killed me. Uh, uh, so my, my way of coping with it was to, was to address it. I mean, it's always been my way. I mean, I know one or two of you were here the last time I read. I read from a book called One Crimson Thread, which was about the death of my first wife uh, and my mourning uh, uh, immediately after her death. I was up at 6 o'clock every morning doing that and then going in at 12 o'clock to spend three hours at my wife. But it was my only way of doing it. People said, why don't you join a support group and so on? And I said, I can't. That's not my way of handling life. I do, this is what I do. And so the same way during the pandemic, I was, I was doing it. And then, of course, as the thing progressed, I, I began to think, you know, what caused this? And more, what, what, have we learned anything from it? Uh, and then I, so I began to think, and, and then I was reading this, I mean, as I, I quoted from Science, which is a very um, prestigious scientific journal, saying there are going to be more unless we pull in, unless we pull in our horns, you know. Uh, uh, so so I, I, I felt you had to think that through. And then I happened to read that other book, which I mentioned, the, you know, the, by Shoshana Zuboff. Uh, and, and she shows how all the time you're being spied on and things are being driven at you. You're being given these fake desires the whole time, things you need to buy with one click, what you have to get, and so forth. And it's very hard to see how you can, with that going on, how you can control consumption in any way, you know, how you can curb it in any way. Uh, uh, and, and, but then, as I said, People say, well, that's nature. People want things. They desire things. They want things. But then I, I said to myself, you know, what, what's worth desiring in life? You know, what's really worth desiring in life? And that, it seems to me, the only hope for us, actually, is some sense, again, of the sacred. Some sense that there's something beyond us, which, you know, which gives us a, a way of transcending our, our own immediate desires and, and, and egos. Uh, um, so that was the pro progression of the book. It started in the, con in, the, in the pandemic, and then as the pandemic began to cease, I began to think more about why and how, how it, how, what was causing it and so forth. Because as I said at the end of one of the lines, you know, we, may have, we may have curbed the pandemic, but we haven't stopped it, in, uh, you know, unless we really think this through. Uh, um, there's somebody there with a hand at the back, I think, is there? Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. That was absolutely beautiful. I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not catching it. Could, could oh, somebody? Wait, can you hear, can you hear me? Uh, now a little bit, if you project. Okay. Sorry, I was just saying, thank you so much for sharing your work. That was absolutely beautiful and very thought provoking. I was, um, can, can you hear me? <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not getting it. Come up and, come up and ask the question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> or somebody, yeah, there, there's somebody that will help. Hello? Hi. <laughs> I just said that I, that was very beautiful and very thought provoking. So thank you so much for sharing your work. Thank you. And I was curious about the part where you talk about yearning for what we could anticipate. I was really curious to know what inspired that 
um, that idea for you? Well, well, it's it's my past, you see, because I'm pre I'm pre uh, computer age, and and I know the, I know the thing the, the, I know what serendipity means when you go looking for things, and the delay. There was an excitement. You went to the library. You had to pull books out. You had to find things, and look at you know. I mean, you go into a, you went into a shop and you looked for you looked for a biography, say, of Milton, and you came out with Arthur Miller because they were they, they were both similarly spelt you know there's all sorts of things could happen uh, uh, but it is but the search you know the, it's the old thing the journey is is as important as the arrival the, so there was a whole whole world of serendipity going on and, and uh, which and, and delay and time to digest things now it's just and it's there. You can get the answers, and of course, I find. Yes, of course, of course, I'm I'm fond to it. I mean, it's a great solver of arguments, as you know, at, at dinner tables. Uh, pull out your phone <laughs> and, and, and look 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 it up and so forth. But but it it is it, it's um, we all we all do it. But but you know you can't retain all the information you get either. It's, it's overload in some ways. You, you know, whereas the the slower processes, I think, of, of finding things also had something to do with remembering them. Uh, I mean, I'm not, wanting to, I'm not a Luddite, I'm not wanting to go back, but I was, I, I was pointing out, you know, that there's, it's all, look, when people started originally to be able to read, their memories changed. I mean, I know of, um, I know, you know of storytellers, traditional storytellers in the Irish language, and they recorded three or four volumes of, and they couldn't read, but they were, they were recorded three or four volumes of folk tales and things, which they knew by heart, and they couldn't read. So there's a price always with, with technology, you know, that, that you know, they, you, 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 and they had what they called in folklorists called the passive tradition, tradition bearers. Uh, they, they had people who were sitting there who'd heard the stories over and over again, who'd correct them if they went, to, if they went astray. Uh, you know, so so there's a whole. The, you, you, you know, the, the same thing is true, of course, of calculators. I, I don't know. Does everybody learn tables in schools now? I don't know. Or do you just use your calculator? I I I, I, I don't know. But but what I'm saying, saying is that you've got to think through what the price of of a technological advi advance is. I'm not as I say, I'm not against them. They have all sorts of functions, but there are costs. Uh, Hello. Do you think that there is, you know, a parallel of greed and, you know, the example you're saying of your wife in surgery and someone snatching the ventilator away with the greed of, you know, advertisers and um, those different things that are online. Um, so I know you highlighted it a lot with online as well, but, you know, just in normal life, we kind of show greed. So what was... Kind of that situation, like, was that... Uh, uh, well, that, that wasn't greed, that was need. That was need. dire need for the emergency room. It was, it was the last... The, 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 the word the surgeons use is, is what is it? Uh, they, 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 talk, they talk about elective surgery, it's not the, is, is the term. It was the last of elective surgery. In other words, surgery that you decide... I mean, that, well, well, I mean it wasn't completely elective. My wife is a breast cancer surgeon. So uh, and the, what they had to actually... What they had to do was use hormonal treatment to postpone, to hold, to, to, to hold the case as best they could until they could get back to doing surgery. I mean, well, it's not exactly elective because it had to be done, but, but uh, you know, elective is more, I suppose, plastic surgery or things that you are not urgent. But it wasn't greed in that case. It was simply dire need because the, the ventilators were far too scarce. They hadn't enough of them, uh, and people had, would die. And uh, uh, So, so uh, that wasn't, it was just, uh, but just, I, I remember it so well. I remember there was the last operation she did before COVID had died down because you know, the, the ventilators were de it was death or life, life or death for these people. Whereas, you know, they could treat with hormones, uh, hormonal treatment. They could stave off for a couple of months. They could stave off the need for the for the um, the the um, you know the uh, to the the um, surgery to you know for lump lumpectomies or mastectomies or whatever was was needed. Um, hi. Hello. Um, I was wondering, do you have any advice for us as a younger generation on how to address some of these issues, like consumerism specifically? Uh, address which? Consumerism. Consumerism. 
Well, I, I mean, I, I, I'm very loath to give advice always because I don't take my own advice always. But, <laughs> but, 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 but the, the, the uh, I mean, the, the real question is, do I need it, isn't it? Do I need it? Is, 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 is it something that I really need or is this just, uh, am I just, you know, it's a new iPhone, it's a new model, do I need it? You know, you know, I think that's the question, isn't it, really? You know, uh, um, and, and uh, I mean, there's all sorts of efforts we can make. I mean, I mean uh, we are moving towards electrical cars, for instance, which seems to be an, an advance. Uh, um, but, but the, and there's all sorts of things like leaving the car idling and so on. And uh, there's lots of, lots of things like that that we, I think we can, we can do. We're going to clear this place out with questions. Time for one more question. Yeah. There's, still There's one, one lady at the back there, I think. How do you respond to people, and especially Christians, who think that time is sort of this inevitable cure-all for all ails? And, you know, when we're thinking about the climate crisis, how would you respond to people? I, I, I think I know what you're talking about. There's a certain... There's a certain um, dare I use the word fundamentalist argument, which says, leave it up to God, you know, uh, uh, you know God will cure all this, don't we shouldn't be, be doing thing. And of course, I think I tried to address that when I told you the story about please buy a ticket. Uh, you know, in other words, we have to do, uh, as human beings, I feel, all we can, uh, uh, which, which, which is not a lack of trust in God, but it's, it's using whatever, whatever gifts we've been given to, to do the best we can. Uh, um, but I know that fundamentalist one, you know, uh, don't interfere, God will cure the whole thing and so on. I, I, I don't go for that. Uh, it's, uh, I'm afraid it's play as if you couldn't pray at that point. Well, that, that yeah. Both play and pray and pray. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. class and things to get to. Uh, in the meantime, though, we do have a book signing, and there are books for sale. Um, so that's uh, still an option. Um, but feel, so feel free to stay and talk more. You should, also you should also point out they're at a, they're 20% off. They're 20% off? Yes. Yes, there you go. So for, 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 for student budgets. <laughs> yes.